Mmm, chocolate. Sweet, bitter, complexly flavored, and melt in your mouth decadent. Chocolate is one of the most pleasurable foods on the planet. Ooh. It's also complicated. If you live in Switzerland, chances are good that you ate about 20 pounds of chocolate this year. Nice work. Here in the US, chocolate consumption per person is about half that. So we've got some work to do. But this goal should be pretty easy to achieve. There's so many ways to consume chocolate. Bars, cocoa powder, ice cream, fudge, cookies, brownies, you name it. And yet all of those are many steps removed from chocolate's origins in nature. The cacao plant is a tropical tree that grows only within 20 degrees latitude on either side of the equator. Its Latin name, Theobroma cacao, means food of the gods. Cacao flowers are pollinated by midges, which are tiny little insects that are kind of annoying to humans, but are key to chocolate production. So I guess not that annoying to humans. Each tree yields 20 to 50 fruits, which are football-shaped pods packed with almond-shaped seeds that are stuck in a mucilaginous pulp. Yum. In this state, cacao seeds have very little flavor except for intense bitterness, thanks to a high concentration of tannins. The seeds and pulp are removed from the pod and fermented for anywhere from two to eight days. Yep, just like wine, yogurt, and sauerkraut, chocolate is a fermented food. Once fermentation is complete, the seeds are separated from the pulp and dried. Only now can they be referred to technically as cocoa beans. The beans are then roasted, which transforms their flavor from sour and bitter to complex and intoxicating. The hard, brittle shell of the beans is then removed to reveal the nibs. Now this is the first chocolate product that we can actually get our hands on as consumers. And nibs are great. They're crunchy, they're bitter, really, really flavorful. They're nice added to ice cream or homemade granola bars. But most nibs don't make it into ice cream. Instead, they're milled into a paste called cocoa liquor, which contains about equal parts cocoa butter and cocoa solids. Those solids would be starches, proteins, tannins, and the stimulants of theobromine and caffeine. And here is where cocoa first becomes chocolate as we know it. Often other ingredients are added, like sugar, milk, solids, and soy lecithin, and the mixture is passed over heated rollers to make a smooth textured mass. In the next phase of the process, known as conching, the chocolate is mixed, ground, kneaded, and heated for hours or sometimes even days. This step softens the flavor and further smooths out the texture. Finally, the chocolate is tempered, which gives it a smooth, glossy appearance, and it makes it so it melts in your mouth, not in your hand. We'll talk more about tempering when we head to the kitchen. The tempered chocolate is then molded, and finally, we have our chocolate bar. End of the complicated stuff. Let's stuff our faces with chocolate. Uh, except even in bar form, there's kind of a lot to know. Let's keep going. There are a ton of chocolate bar options at the store these days, and they'd be kind of confusing. Let's start with that bar that I tasted at the top of the show. That bar was completely unsweetened, which is an anomaly among today's chocolate bar options. But in fact, unsweetened baking bars most closely resemble how chocolate has been consumed for the better part of its 3,500 year history. It wasn't until 1847 that a British company started pressing chocolate and sugar together into bars to make the first eating chocolate. Right on that package of the unsweetened chocolate bar, we see 100% cacao. Cacao refers to the total amount of cocoa solids and cocoa butter. As a general rule, the higher the cacao percentage, the darker and more intense the chocolate. If we start adding sugar, we land in the world of bittersweet and semi-sweet chocolate. And we refer to both of these as dark chocolate to differentiate them from milk chocolate. The FDA states that any bar labeled bittersweet, semi-sweet, or dark must be at least 35% cacao. But they don't make any distinction between bittersweet and semi-sweet. So you could have a bittersweet bar that is sweeter than a semi-sweet bar and a semi-sweet bar that's sweeter than a bittersweet bar. What a world we live in. Now 35% might be the minimum, but you'd be hard pressed to go to the supermarket and find a bar with a number that low on the label. 60, 75, 80, even 90 are common cacao percentages now. At Cook's Illustrated, for our baking money, 60% cacao is the sweet spot. If you're eating the bar straight up, go for whatever floats your chocolate boat. If we add more sugar and milk solids, we get, drum roll, milk chocolate. Now, making room for all that sugar and milk means we have less room for cacao, making milk chocolate automatically less chocolatey. But what we lose in chocolatey punch, we gain in creamy, creamy goodness. Nowadays, I know it's cool to say stuff like, I don't really like milk chocolate. I only eat dark chocolate. And I know I'm gonna get a lot of comments for this, but I gotta set the record straight. It's not true. Milk chocolate is delicious. You love milk chocolate. You've always loved milk chocolate. You always will love milk chocolate. And it's okay to admit that. 
All right, let's get back to it. Now there is one chocolate that it's okay to say that you don't like, and that's white chocolate because it's gross. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But in all honesty, white chocolate is kind of a weird one because it contains cocoa butter, but no cocoa solids. So it's kind of chocolate. And it's true that some brands are unbearably sweet and not really all that palatable. But a good brand of white chocolate can be a great thing in baking where its sweetness is balanced. All right, I think that's all the confusing stuff. Let's go to the kitchen and eat. I mean, cook and experiment with chocolate. I'm gonna start by whipping up one of my favorite cookies in the entire world. It's called Millionaire Shortbread, but it probably could just be called a homemade Twix bar. This is Cook's Illustrated Deputy Editor Andrea Geary's recipe. And if you make a batch, you'll be the most popular person at work, in your family, on the bus, on the walk to the bus, you name it. I wanna race right to the chocolate part, so real quick, you make a simple pat in the pan crust with melted butter, flour, sugar, and salt. Then you make an equally dead simple caramel layer with sweetened condensed milk, brown sugar, heavy cream, corn syrup, butter, salt. And then it's chocolate time. The top layer of millionaire shortbread should be a thin, snappy, shiny sheet of dark chocolate. Thin, snappy sheets of dark chocolate are tempered chocolate. So let's talk about tempering. When it solidifies, the fat and cocoa butter can form any of six different types of crystals. Each of these crystals has a different melting point, ranging from 63 degrees all the way up to 97 degrees. For the best sheen and texture, you want as many of the crystals as possible to form one special type called beta crystals. Beta crystals produce the ideal snappy texture and have the ideal melting point for our mouths of 93 degrees. Commercially and professionally, tempering is done by heating and cooling chocolate repeatedly to form as many beta crystals as possible. When you get that professionally tempered chocolate at home and you melt it, you are melting those crystals. Check out this experiment. Here's what happens if you just fully melt chocolate and then let it cool. It sets up flexible and soft and it melts on contact with your fingers. Ew, gross chocolate. So how do you melt chocolate, which we need for all kinds of baking applications, including our millionaire shortbread, and still keep it in temper? Use your microwave. We'll start by chopping up three quarters of the chocolate that we want to melt. Oop, and quick sidebar. Check out this experiment. Here's what happens when you chop chocolate with a flat edge chef's knife. And here's what happens when you use a toothy serrated knife. The flat edge of the chef's knife creates a wide point of contact between the knife and the chocolate. That requires a lot of force to push the knife through. That causes dangerous chocolate to fly everywhere. The tiny teeth on the serrated knife, on the other hand, easily slide through, keeping everyone safe. Now we take our chopped chocolate and microwave it on 50% power, stirring often until most but not all of the chocolate is melted. We're looking to stay below 93 degrees, so we keep as many of those precious beta crystals intact and unmelted. Then we stir in the remaining quarter of the chocolate, which we grated on a fine rasp grater. This tempered stuff is loaded with intact beta crystals, and that will seed the chocolate and promote the formation of more beta crystals. Then we just pour our chocolate over the caramel layer, spread it out, where it will harden to a shiny snap in just minutes. Now look, any way you eat chocolate is the best way to eat chocolate. But I made this millionaire shortbread, and I always end the show by eating the thing that I made on the show, and then saying, this is how to eat, so you know what's coming. This is without a doubt how to eat chocolate. Now look, I like you a lot, but I want you to be more popular. So I want you to go make some millionaire shortbread, get on the bus, bring them to your holidays. Trust me, it'll work.